All right, I think we can get started. Make sure this is working here. Um, all right, so uh, before we get into the new stuff, the I didn't hear any resistance to my third exam final idea yesterday, so and I saw some some supportive comments, so um, we'll we'll do that. I'm uh, just about done because I just took all the stuff I had written for the third exam, which so that'll be about a third, a little more than a third of the final actually, and then um, I'll add in some of the other stuff and uh, hopefully get that up to you later today or tomorrow. And that way you'll have this week, next week, we'll do, we won't do anything new in class. It'll just be about questions and review. And then the exam will be due um, the middle of the following week, which would be exam week. So um, that way you'll have about two weeks to work on the final. Uh, and then, and that'll basically be it. Um, we won't, uh, except for the project. So you can get the projects in again around that same time frame because we're not doing presentations. Um, we don't really need to have those in early, so those can also be uh, submitted at some point in the middle of exam week. I just need to make sure to have enough time to get them graded so that I can get the final grades in uh, that following week. So, uh, so yes, this is the last day we are learning new things. Although every day you should learn new things because that just makes life better, right? So. Um, you know, you, you don't have to stop learning new things. You could just like look up random whatever. And those of you who haven't been paying attention, you'll get to still learn new things as you get ready for the next exam because you haven't been, you know, learning them yet. But uh, um, yeah, so Lily asked, is the research paper do on May 4th or exam week. Um, so the original plan was to have that done due next week um, so that I could get it back to you before the exam. But I, uh, because of everything, I want to be more flexible with that. So as long as you can get that in before the date the exam is due, which would be probably, which would be our exam day, which would be May 13th. So we'll just say everything is due May 13th. Um, labs should still be due by the end of this week, so I can get going with those. Um, I've also got two quizzes to get to get in, uh, to get graded now. So uh, labs should still be due the end of this week. Research paper and the final will be due that very last exam day. And then I think um, we they gave us an extra week or so to get grades in this semester too. So I'll try not to take too long with that, but um, you know, I'll do what I can. Um, okay, the, what else was I gonna say about that? So hopefully all that's going well. Oh yeah, if, you, if you're done with your paper or you're getting close to done or whatever, if you could just turn it in, um, I, ideally, early, the earlier you can turn it in, the easier things are for all of us because it gives you more time to focus on the final um, and not be rushing to finish a big paper right as you're also trying to do a final exam. So um, if you've got a progress on that paper and you are already planning on turning it in next week, uh, I would say stick to that schedule if you can because then you can really just focus on that final exam uh, for the last week and then be done. So, um, other questions about that? Oh, for the final paper? Um, yeah, I'll put in submission. Sorry, I keep forgetting about that. So I will uh, try to remember to do that this afternoon um, so you can put in the, you can put that in that way. Um, uh, it's easier if everything goes on Blackboard because then I, it's, for sure there and you know when you submitted it and there's no issue of like me forgetting to find it in my email or, or anything like that. So thanks. All right, other questions before we start on our last new things of the semester.
All right. Uh, so we actually, you know, we didn't go get too far behind in terms of the what we had planned on the schedule. Uh, we're skipping chapter 11, the spectroscopy. That was always planned to skip from the beginning of the semester. And uh, getting into a little bit of 12 and 13, which is aldehydes and ketones, carboxylic acids and esters, that kind of chemistry. Um, that's, what, four chapters or something. So we're not going to cover four chapters in one day. Uh, I just want to give you a taste of what these types of functional groups can do and why they're important and um, some of the basic reactions. It'll also give you a little bit more of a toolkit when it comes to synthesis problems for the final exam. So when you're trying to figure out how to synthesize these, these molecules, the more different reactions that are possible, the easier those actually end up being because it gives you more choice in how you can prepare those things. So hopefully this will help a bit with that as well. So just to review uh, from what we already know, aldehydes have this type of a functional group. Ketones are like this. And today we'll probably also talk a little bit about uh, carboxylic acids and esters, which are also all based on that carbonyl group. So let's talk about the carbonyl. The carbon double bond to oxygen is a really important functional group in chemistry. It's present in all kinds of molecules, lots and lots of things, biological molecules, synthetic molecules, whatever. Um, and it's all, all of it can really be boiled down to a pretty simple property that the carbonyl group has a dipole. And the carbon of the carbonyl group is electrophilic. And the oxygen of the carbonyl group is it's partially negative charged. It's actually not all that nucleophilic. But the carbon can act as an electrophile. So pretty much all of these uh, types of molecules are going to react like this. You're going to have some nucleophile. Maybe it's negatively charged, maybe it's not. And the nucleophile can react with that partial positive carbon. And rather than having a leaving group leaving, because we have a double bond to the oxygen, those remaining electrons can go up onto oxygen. We know oxygen can stabilize a negative charge pretty well. And then if we have an aldehyde or a ketone, um, there's going to be a protonation then. That results in an alcohol forming here. So we can add the nucleophile to the carbon here, and the oxygen becomes an alcohol. For hydrogen, for R, that's always how that works. Uh, when, this in, when this is an ester or an acid or a carboxylic acid or an amide or something like that, now you have essentially a leaving group here, and then something else can happen. So we'll, we'll get into that um, if we get there. So, what's my place here? So that's the, the main important reactivity that we're going to look at today. Um, we can also look briefly at naming. So to do that, I want to get this table from the book. This is page 400 in the book. We can kind of keep all these things, look at all these things together. Um, the notes should be linked into that folder that's linked from Blackboard if you um, can't read this. Also, again, it's on page 400 if you've got a copy of the book nearby. 
Um, but what this is saying is you've got these different types of functional groups and their order of precedence. So this is the priority that those groups are getting in the naming. And then some examples. So uh, let's look at the couple that we've already seen, which are these last three, alcohols, amines, and thiols. So when those are like the main important part of a molecule, they become an all, like alcohols, like you know, pentane becomes pentanol. But when there is a more important group, a higher precedence group in, present in the molecule, then they become named like a substituent. So in this example here, you have a four carbon molecule that has an alcohol, but it has a ketone, a carbonyl, which has a higher precedence. So the molecule is named own for ketone, so it's a 2-butanone, and the alcohol is a hydroxy now instead of an all. So we don't say butanolone or butanonol. We say 4-hydroxy-2-butanone. All right. So that happens between um, alcohols and amines also. So alcohol has higher precedence than amine. So if a molecule has both an OH and an NH2, it's numbered and named based on the alcohol, so this is one propanol, and the amine is named amino as a substituent. So then if you have multiple carbonyl substituents, the same thing happens. Um, carboxyl, which is carboxylic acid, is the highest priority, followed by aldehyde and then ketone. So here are some examples of molecules that have both of those functional groups in there. If it has a ketone and an aldehyde, the aldehyde takes precedence and it's named butanal. And then instead of being, instead of the ketone giving it an own suffix, it's oxo. So it's oxobutanal. All right. If it has an aldehyde and a carboxylic acid, same thing, oxopropanoic acid. So um, for our class and for our purposes here, you don't need to memorize all that in that order. Um, I wouldn't expect you to in the normal in-person class either. But you should know that there is a rule for dealing with this. And so when you get a molecule that has multiple parts like that, make sure that you go look this up and look at a table like this and figure out what has precedence and, um, and how you're going to name those things. OK? So let's try it. Let's practice naming a couple molecules here and using the table if you need to, using other references if you need to. You don't need to name this just off the top of your head. Uh, so I'll give you um, two different molecules here. And I want you to try to name them. So each molecule has two functional groups. You have to decide which functional group takes priority and then how you're going to name that. So I can pull this back up if you want to see that table. Although now I'm covering up that, that one.
Now we're in focus again. So type in some names when you think you've got them. Uh, that is the right idea, but no. Um, so 4-hydroxy, yeah, so 4-hydroxy 2-butanone is the example here. That's this one. So this one's going to be a little bit different. So make sure you've got your numbering right, and there's something else going on there, too. Yeah, that's 2-heptanone. So what would that full name be? Nobody wants to type anything? Or are you still still working? Okay, R four hydroxy two heptanone. Yeah, six hydroxy two heptanone. All right, I like that one for the second one. Okay, R6-hydroxy 2-heptanone. Um, no, you're good. Thank you for adding a, a name for us. Uh, all right, so let's talk about where that name comes from. Uh, R is the stereo center here. 6-hydroxy, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. We, we have to number from the right because the ketone gets the precedence, and so that's one, two, three, that, that, we have to start from here, so the ketone gets the lower number. So it's two heptanone, and the hydroxy is on six. All right, so over here, this is actually a molecule similar to what we would have seen um, in the aromatics chapter. But the same idea applies. We have two functional groups, and they both have special benzene-based names. We know that the amino become, makes it aniline, and the carboxylic acid makes it benzoic acid. So is this a 4-carboxyaniline or a 4-aminobenzoic acid? So we go back to the chart here, and we can see that the um, benzoic acid, the acid part, the acid functional group, takes precedence there. So we have to call this one 
four amino or para amino. All right. Benzoic acid or para amino. Questions about that? Okay. So let's get into um, one of the most useful reactions of aldehydes and ketones that you will find really helpful for these synthetic transformations. These are called Grignard reactions. All right, this is um, French, so I don't know how anybody here speak French. It's like sort of like Grignard, and the D is not like a hard D. I don't know how to express that, but we'll just say Grignard um, for now. It's not Grignard. That's the only thing is, you know, don't pronounce the G. Um, so in these reactions, we're actually using a metal catalyst to make an extremely strong nucleophile out of carbon. And carbon nucleophiles are really important and useful because they allow us to build up carbon chains in a way that we haven't before. Uh, the only way that we've seen to build, to connect carbons together is with um, acetylide ions, so um, using like triple bonded carbon that gets deprotonated and then can do substitution type chemistry with some limitations there. Um, so let's look at what Grignard reagents are. So a Grignard reagent is you take a, an alkyl, um, you take an alkyl bromide and you react it with magnesium metal in ether solvent usually. So just plain old magnesium metal, like little chips of it, depending on how strong of a reagent you need, how easy it is to form, you can use like a powdered magnesium or just like little chunks of it. Um, I don't think we had it scheduled in this class, but in the other organic chemistry class, we do a Grignard reaction um, in class. And you make this thing, which is often depicted like this. It's not exactly what the structure is, um, but, but it's a good approximation of it. And what this is kind of acts like is it acts like a carbon nucleophile. So this, this magnesium bromide, which in this case would be a, a butyl magnesium bromide, let's write that name down. acts as this strong carbon nucleophile that can then attack carbonyl groups. So there is one thing we have to watch out for before we can look at the reaction. So I want to talk about that first. And that is that Grignard reagents, these things that we just made, are strong bases. So that means that they cannot be used in the presence of things like alcohols, anything protic, it will deprotonate. So if you try to make um, if you try to take a Grignard reagent like this and react it with something like that, 
even if there's other stuff on the molecule that you want it to react with, all it's going to do is deprotonate that alcohol. Sorry, I'm in my hair. So this carbon-like nucleophile can actually deprotonate the alcohol and make um, the neutral butane because we know that pKa's of alkanes like this are extremely high. So this is a really, really strong base. So you can only use it, if you want to use it in a reaction, if you want to like connect things, do stuff with it, you have to make sure there's no protic stuff around. Um, and we'll talk more about that when we look at some syntheses. If we had more time, we would also talk about how to protect protic groups from green neutered reagents. You can actually put things on that protect them, do the reaction, and then take them off later. So let's look at what these things can do to uh, aldehydes and ketones. Let's take our butyl magnesium bromide. And react that with uh, formaldehyde. So formaldehyde is the simplest aldehyde, one carbon, like that. And we can draw this mechanism similar to what we looked at before. Uh, so the nucleophilic carbon here, we're going to think about this as a nucleophilic carbon, can add to the aldehyde and make something like this. Okay. Then we can do a, what's called a workup. So we do another step where we protonate it by adding some dilute acid. And we end up with an alcohol. All right, so let's take a look at what we just did here. We took a four carbon Grignard reagent. We added another carbon here. And we ended up with a five carbon alcohol. That extra carbon came from the aldehyde. So this is a way of making carbon-carbon bonds that also ends up uh, with an alcohol in the structure. So we got, a, we got a primary alcohol there. Okay, let's look at some other, uh, let's look at the addition with some other reagents and some other um, aldehydes and ketones. So if we took, let's say, this kind of a Grignard, and one of the things that's so powerful and nice about Grignard reagents is you can make them out of essentially any um, alkyl bromide. So any carbon with any bromide that you can think of, chlorides too in a lot of cases, you can turn into a Grignard reagent by adding magnesium and suddenly make it into a nucleophile that can then react with other stuff and connect and make carbon-carbon bonds. So this time, let's react this with a bigger 
aldehyde. Say like this one, butanal. And we're going to do the same thing. Same type of reaction. Now we've connected this carbon to this one. Well, where those are connecting? This one to this one. I'm going to number these separately so that we can trace this. So one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then over here we have one, two, three, four. So carbon one from the cyclohexane is connecting to carbon one of the aldehyde. So there's one. And then we'll have three more, two, three, and four. The oxygen is still connected to carbon number one there. And then if we do that workup step again and add acid, we can protonate and make the alcohol. So think again about what we've just done from a synthetic standpoint. We've taken two different carbon chain molecules and we've connected them to make a much larger molecule. And this expands our synthetic possibilities enormously because we don't have to just worry about interconverting functional groups. We can actually start building up bigger and bigger molecules. Um, let's think about what we could do from here synthetically. So what if we wanted to add even more stuff over here? We could potentially do something like this. We know about oxidation chemistry, right? We could oxidize that alcohol. And then we could react this with another Grignard reagent. Let's say we just wanted two carbons, ethyl magnesium bromide, and then we want that second step to protonate it and make the alcohol. So now the ethyl magnesium bromide can react again with that ketone. We can add that ethyl group onto that carbon, make that alcohol again, um, and then we could even go on from there. So now we know all the alcohol chemistry from chapter um, eight. So we could dehydrate this and make it alkene, um, which we could then do alkene stuff with. Uh, or we could um, do, you know, use cyanyl chloride and turn that into a chlorine and do some other kinds of chemistry, elimination reactions, um, SN1 substitution, whatever. So it really expands our synthetic capacity if we can now put these different pieces together. Okay. So here's a problem for you to think about how these things work. Synthesize 2-phenyl, 2-butanol, by three different Grignard reactions. All right, so let's take a look at 3-phenyl-2-butanol, or 2-phenyl-2-butanol, 
draw that, and then see if you can come up with three different ways to make that using a combination of a Grignard reagent and a ketone. So this is going to be some kind of Grignard reagent and some kind of ketone. Three different ways. Um, there's probably not a great way to put this in the chat, so I'll just give you a few minutes and then we'll talk about it. Take another minute or so.
All right, let's talk about this. So um, first, of course, we need that molecule, 2-phenyl-2-butanol. Okay, there's butane, 2-phenyl, Two butanol, so something like that. Now, what this is saying is the alcohol comes from the carbonyl, so what was a ketone is now the alcohol. But because there's three different R groups attached here, three different carbon groups, we can make this in three different ways. So we can have a couple of different ketones and a couple of different possible uh, green agents. All right, so let's try one. Let's say we want to use the red um, methyl group as a green reagent. Okay, so that means that we're going to start from the ketone that contains everything else. So this is going to be our ketone, and this is going to be added. Um, let's draw that. So we're adding the methyl magnesium bromide to the ketone that's made of everything else. So that's going to be one, two, three carbons, and then phenyl. See that? So the methyl group adds here, and then after the acidic workup, we get everything protonated and get the neutral compound. Uh, let's go the other way now. Now let's say that the, the blue, we want the um, blue one to be the Grignard reagent. Well, if we want the blue one to be the Grignard reagent, that's the ethyl group. Okay. And that means that everything else is the ketones. So the ketones, again, the carbon for the ketone is here, the carbonyl carbon right there. Methyl on one side, phenyl on the other side. All right, so that can be made like that. And then the last way is to use phenyl magnesium bromide. which I'm going to abbreviate PHMGBR. PH is phenyl, so we've got the benzene ring with magnesium bromide coming off of it, followed by that acidic workup. And that means that we're starting with this ketone, which is a, but a two butanone. All right. So does that, do you see how that works? How we can put together that alcohol, that tertiary alcohol in various ways, depending on what we're starting with? Yes, okay, thank you. So, um, so that's the only reaction that we're going to learn um, in, in chapter six or chapter twelve right now. Uh, there, there's other stuff, of course, in there, twelve and thirteen. But um, we're going to focus on on the Grignard reactions right right now, just because it is so useful and so helpful. So let's take a look at some um, synthetic type transformations and think about how we could potentially synthesize these using Grignard reactions.
All right, so let's look at this one. So this at first seems like a very difficult problem because we start with something very small, we end with something very big. Um, but all that really tells us is that we're going to have to use some kind of reaction to um, make carbon-carbon bonds. And the fact that we're ending with an alcohol here tells us, okay, well, we're probably going to use some Grignard adding to aldehyde or ketone chemistry because that's a good way to make um, alcohols and put carbon-carbon stuff together. Okay, so then we're starting to work backwards. How could we possibly do this? So we want to do the, the same um, kind of exercise that we just did, where we focus on the alcohol and we think about how could we have made that connection. And there's always going to be multiple possibilities there. So we can think about this kind of connection, we can think about this kind of connection. Um, if we take this one on the right, we're saying that we want like a methyl Grignard reagent to attach to this whole ketone thing or this whole aldehyde. And that's probably possible, but that doesn't fit well with the fact that we have to start with a two carbon thing. Um, so that's probably not a great starting spot, a great starting choice. The other side, if we, if we, take, if we look at breaking this bond or making this bond through a Grignard reagent, then we're saying that this is going to be the alcohol. And the reason that that looks better is because this is a two or a two carbon piece. So let's get rid of this. If we take a two carbon piece and connect something else, that makes sense to me because I know we're starting with a two carbon piece. So starting with a two carbon piece, ending with a two carbon piece, attaching this thing, that makes more sense. Now, in order to attach that thing, uh, we have to think about how we're going to make this into an aldehyde. So this is where it really starts to be useful to think backwards instead of forwards. Because starting with this and then thinking, how am I going to get to this, there's just too many different possible choices and reps. But starting here and saying, I know I'm going to form this from a Grignard reaction. Let's figure out which Grignard reaction makes it a little bit easier. Um, so if I know that I'm going to be starting this, doing this from a Grignard reaction, and I know I eventually want to get back to this two carbon piece. That means that I know what kind of Grignard reagent I want to use. I want to use this. That's the nucleophile. That's the thing that I want to be attacking my carbonyl. And that means that the carbonyl I'm using is going to be an aldehyde that looks like this, a two carbon aldehyde. So you're with me so far? Here's our Grignard reagent adding to the aldehyde. So this carbon here can attack carbon one and make the alcohol. Uh, again, that's a two-step process because of the need for an acidic workup to protonate the alcohol. But the important part is the Grignard connection there. So this is going to connect to there. And so then the rest of the problem becomes a little bit simpler because now we don't have to worry about adding carbons anymore. We can just talk about functional group interconversion, going from an alkene to a, an aldehyde. Um, so we, we can make an aldehyde from an alcohol. Right, from ethanol. And we can make ethanol by adding water to ethene. So there's our synthesis. And the new part here is how do we put that carbon-carbon bond together? And then the rest of it is from here. Questions about that? Let's look at a similar problem that um, by being just a little bit different ends up giving us a different route. So let's say we're starting with the same molecule. Hey, 
And all we're going to change is add one more carbon. Adding one more carbon really changes our route here because, again, we're going to look at the different possible um, spots to connect the carbons. But now we see that if we wanted to go in the same route as before, we actually need a three carbon aldehyde. So in this case, it really makes more sense to form this bond on the other side because we know that eventually we want to get down to a two carbon piece. So if we're doing that, now we're looking at the opposite type uh, of connection where this is the aldehyde and this is the Grignard. Right, there's our two carbon piece and that's going to react with this aldehyde now to give that um, to give that product. So now when we think about getting from this back to here, well we have to add magnesium to make a greenyard from a bromine, from a bromide, sorry. And we can make an alkyl bromide by adding to the alkene. So once we've got that connection and how we're going to make the greenyard, then we can go back and, and do our functional group interconversion as we have before. All right, questions about those? So when you're using Grignard reagents in your synthesis, you want to look for that alcohol or something that was, that was an alcohol. Synthesis means it could have been an alcohol earlier than that. Um, and then think about ways to get those things connected. Um, just a couple of, again, reminders about things that Grignard reagents cannot do. Is they can't be anywhere where there's acidic hydrogens. And that actually include it, includes alkyl halides. So one thing that I see people doing um, with Grignard reagents that's a mistake. Yeah, yeah, you'd need a, a second step there, sorry. Thank you. Um, so one thing I see sometimes is because these things are so useful, like, oh, we can just put our pieces together, however, people start wanting to use Grignard reagents for all kinds of nucleophilic transformations, and they don't work that way. Um, you can't really use Grignard reagents let's get a little more space here for typical substitution chemistry, um, and I'll show you why. So let's say we have I'm going to use a different halide just so that we're not confused. Let's say we have something like iodocyclohexane. And um, we want to Like add a methyl, add an ethyl group onto there. So you say, oh, okay, I can use um, ethyl magnesium bromide, and that will just um, do like an SN2 substitution, and then I've made my carbon structure. That doesn't work. Okay, why doesn't it work? Well, it doesn't work because we have to think about how substitutions and eliminations are always. Uh, happening are always kind of happening on the same types of substrate, right? Any kind of substitution substrate like this is also an elimination substrate. It's got all these hydrogens, right? And we always said back in chapter seven, watch out with alkyl halides because they can do substitutions and eliminations. So you have to think about the conditions. And Grignard conditions, that's not an M, there we go. Grignard conditions are such that it's a very strong base. So rather than do the substitution, a Grignard reagent will always do the elimination, the E2 elimination, because it's a strong base.
So you can't use Grignard reagents around alkyl halides unless, of course, you want to do elimination, but there's usually better ways to do that. Um, so don't think of these as like uh, always working in all types of situations. They add to aldehydes and ketones to make alcohols, and they do do some other reactions that if you kind of read ahead in Chapter 13, there's some other things you can do with Grignards, um, but they do not do our kind of typical substitution chemistry. All right, uh, so we'll stop there. Any questions before we end? All right, I'm not seeing any questions. Well, you are welcome to stick around as always. Um, if you have some questions. Otherwise, I will be back in that other room at 11 today and on Friday, and you can always email me to set up other appointments. Next week, Monday and Wednesday, will be um, review and whatever kinds of questions you have about homework, about the exam. So I'll, um, I'll send an announcement out when I get the exam posted, and you can start working on that. Um, so please let me know if you have any questions. And I hope you're all doing well. And uh, yeah, stick around if you want to. Bye.